people to grow a church. It doesn't take a lot of people to grow. Period. John Wesley said, just give me a hundred men who love God and hate the world and watch you come back. A hundred men who love God and hate sin will change the world. That's all I want. It doesn't take much. It just takes some people really crossed over. I think we're, our culture is plainly in a consumer type of generation. And it, it's moved right into the church. And we're going to get into some of that. We need to be in church. That means our head, our heart, and our hands are involved this whole process of crossing over. When that happens, we no longer go to church, we become the church. Last week I talked about this study done in Indonesia. It's based on these two groups of people. These two groups of people went into Indonesia. It was a study that was cataloged after five years. These two groups of Christians came in. The blessers came into Indonesia to be a blessing. They all came in to, to start a business, but they came in to start a business and be a blessing to the people around them. And then as they blessed people, they shared about Jesus. And then the converters came in at the same time to start a business, but their object was to convert people. And the blessers had five times more conversions than the converters. And need to be a blessing to people, to raise the level that we actually love people. And that's the question sometimes that I've asked leaders before, do you really love the people? Do you really love them? I remember one particular occasion, it was some years ago, 15 or 17 years ago, where it occurred to me, I had lost love for the people that I was pastoring. And I remember I went home and I cried all day. It broke my heart. I could see it. It hurt me. I said, I had lost the love. I had lost a, a real love. walk into people's lives, to come alongside of them. And this is the process of blessing people. We go dead. We give them prayer. God, I want your heart for them. God, I want to, I want to, I want to go to the people. This, I remember there was an occasion that was, this was almost 30 years ago. I remember I went to the altar of the church and I was pastor there. I've only been pastor there, I don't know, six months. And I remember going to the altar, I said, God, lead me to someone that really wants to know you. And then minutes later, I got a call from someone in the congregation that said their neighbor is behind on their rent. This guy, he has a sickness. They want to talk to somebody and they don't know what to do. So I, I said, sure, I'll talk with them. And that's the second one. We're going to spell B-L-E-S-T, blessed. The 
second one is listen to people. So I just sat down and I listened. I listened to Mike King. They had problems. They were behind in many different ways. I remember actually sitting down with them several times. And it occurred to me that they needed, they needed bailed out. It was to the tune of close to ten thousand dollars. So I came, I went to the church board and I said, there's this this couple. And they asked me to announce it in front of the congregation. And the next day, all the money came in. And it wasn't a gift. It was, we will give it to you. You pay us back. And in this process, this couple came to know Jesus. And he got healed from a liver disease. God reached down. Begin with prayer. You listen. I think one time, so, uh, this is one thing that I, I believe that we as ministers need to be very conscious of. Are we listening more than talking or are we talking more than listening? That's a huge deal. I get nervous when someone new comes in our midst and people talking more than this to the people that are new. I get nervous. Begin with prayer. Listen to them. Eat with them. There's something powerful about bringing people into your home. There's something powerful about sitting down for a meal. If you want to get to know people, put a plate of food down. All of a sudden, people will start talking in ways they haven't talked before. You'll learn things about people you've never learned before. All of a sudden, we're, we're more of a family. It helps. Just look in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, 42 to 46, it says they ate in their homes together with glad hearts. Eat with them. Then serve them. And as you begin to see this process, you'll see what the needs are. You'll be able to serve people. You'll be able to see how you can enter into their life and bless them. And then lastly, tell your story. If you've never done this before, I would ask you, write your story out. Write your testimony out. How you came to Jesus. What happened to your life? Make it. You can have a succinct one that is like five, ten minutes. It's hard to get everything sustained. Do it. Get it. I mean, because you don't want to talk. I mean, if someone, someone made me, by this time, you've earned ten minutes. But you probably haven't learned, earned two hours. Sometimes when some people start to talk, they talk and they talk and they talk, and people don't want to hear it. That You're giving them too much. Just give them five, ten minutes of a, of a nice, you know, get a, have a nice five-minute testimony, a ten-minute testimony. Sometimes they'll interject and you can bring other things in. But get your testimony down. Write it. I'm a, I'm a, I was in this evangelism class, and the... And the the man suggested that. I thought, wow, that was a, that's a great idea. Get your testimony. Write it down. He even put it in a form of a, of a track of some sort with his testimony in it. It was, it was great. And, and that is very personal. It's very personal. Then tell your story. The enemy hates your story. Do you know that? We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by your word of your testimony. Isn't that right? 
There's, the, the enemy doesn't know what to do with the testimony. Because you're talking about the goodness of God. You're talking about the victories. How he won you over. And what has happened to you since. And just don't talk about what happened 30 years ago. Talk about what happened last week. The little things. Which are huge. That he's your savior. Not just for then, but now. He's the lover of your soul. He's the only one that's always been there for you. It's compelling. Back in college, it was Roger Gill who was, I was a freshman, and he was a freshman, and he was in music. The freshmen don't know what they're doing, so they kind of hang out. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we were hanging out together. I like Roger. He was he was he was a he was a keyboard player. I was a trumpet player, and you know, he was just he was a good guy. But he, I know he did. I know he didn't know Jesus. And I started. It, it was so, you know, I don't know how many months out down the line. I was impressed by God. I need I need to tell Roger. God, if this is what you want to do, if you want me to share, here I am on the Moseman Hall. It's, it's, it's in the it's a little lounge area. And I said, if you want me to share with Roger, let him come through. 45 seconds later, here comes Roger. <laughs> said, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. That's how faith is spelled. You don't see the, the picture very much. It says the light church, 24% fewer commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe, 15 minute sermons, 45 minute worship services, we have only eight commandments, your choice. Mm -hmm. We use just three spiritual laws and have an 800-year millennium. Everything you've wanted in a church and less. And less. <laughs> Light church.
church in the United States have become a light church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not just like that, but I have some ones that I'm going to throw up here. Some believe the church is like a gas station. For some people, the church is a place where you fill up your spiritual gas tank when you're running low, mm -hmm. get a good sermon, and it will keep you going for the week. Some people see the church as a movie theater. Here the church is a place that offers entertainment. Go for an hour of escape, hopefully in comfortable seats. Leave your problems at the door and come out smiling and feel better than when you went in. Some people see the church as a drugstore. The church here is a place where you can fill a prescription, take the advice that will help and deal with your pain and problems. In this model, the church is a therapeutic community. Or some people say the church is like a big box retailer. Here the church offers the best products in a clean and safe environment for both you and your family. It offers great services at a low price, all in one stop. Here the church is a producer of programs, children, young people, etc. You won't find any of these pictures of the church in the Bible. All of them are distortions, and they all at least have one thing in common. I'd like, at least, I have one thing that I see that they all have in common, but I'm open to hearing what you all say about that. They have at least one thing. What do they have in common? What's wrong with these images of the church? And, and so what is the church? These are distortions. <clears throat> they have a, a little twist of something in there that is sort of good about it. But these are distortions. So let's, let's get in, in little groups here and let's, let's talk. So what do those things have in common? 